I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation 8. We continue to move right along through this book. As we begin chapter 8, I want to remind you that chapter 7 was really a divine parenthesis between chapter 6 and 8. We are about to plunge into the seventh seal, the last of the seven seals, but not the last of the divine judgments. In chapter 7, we were informed about two different groups, the 144,000 servants of God who were chosen and sealed on earth from the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were chosen to proclaim the gospel to every nation on earth, including Israel. And they will have a significant role in the rest of the book. And we will see that, that there will be a focus on them, on the Jews and God's fulfillment of his covenant promises to them. However, they will also be targeted by Satan and the beast. And, but they'll be sovereignly protected. At least some of them will be a remnant who will survive even into the millennium. The other group of chapter 7 is an innumerable company of redeemed martyrs and other believers standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. And these are those who during the tribulation suffered and are now in heaven, their spirits, they put their faith in God and died either a natural death or a martyr's death. Two factors were probably at work in bringing them to Christ. First, the recognition that these events that were happening were, were divine in origin. They recognize it as being from God and that may be part of what brought them to Jesus Christ. These events were outside the explanation of mere human or naturalistic origin. But secondly, another reason why they came, they might have come to the Lord, is because there were other believers who were speaking to them and witnessing to them. And therefore, we have this growing multitude of believers to proclaim the gospel. Before chapter 7, we ended with the sixth seal. And up to that point, the world had experienced probably close to the, to the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. I want to give us a little bit of a reminder of just what happened during that sixth seal because we're now going to the, into the seventh seal. First of all, we notice that there was a worldwide earthquake caused by the sliding and shifting of the earth's tectonic plates. And this would have resulted in massive volcanoes and tsunamis Together, these acts of nature undoubtedly triggered the crumbling of skyscrapers, I'm sorry, skyscrapers, government buildings, homes, bridges, roads, sinkholes, telephone towers, water mains, gas lines, oil pipelines would be broken, communication systems would be shut down, coastal cities and shipping would have been crippled. The death toll would have been catastrophic. It says that even in the sky, the sun, moon, could not give their light because of uh, the ash and um, gases in the air from volcanoes and damage to the earth. It said the sky rolls up like a mighty scroll, and every mountain and island is moved out of its place. 
undoubtedly by the force of earthquakes and tsunamis. Also, there is their stars seem to fall from the sky. And all of this together causes people to recognize the divine origin of it. And I want to remind us that as, I, as we go through the book of Revelation, I'm using oftentimes things that we would be familiar with, just imagining what it would be like in our day. And also I want to remind us that God does not need natural things to bring this about. He, he can do that, and I believe there are times in our discussion and in our study of Revelation that it, it makes sense that that could be the case. But for instance, in the book of Job, he experienced some very heavy trials. One of those trials was literally fire falling from heaven. That's not something any of us have ever seen, is it? That, that gives us the indication that it's an act of God, clear divine act of God. God, there are several times when that happens in the book of Revelation. We don't need to try to work out some natural phenomenon that might make it happen. It could happen possibly that way, but God doesn't need it to happen. And therefore, we, we don't need to force something on the scriptures that is not there. Now, let me ask you something. If all of those disasters that I shared with you that the, the scriptures talked about in the sixth seal, if all of that happened today, how do you think unbelieving leaders of nations would explain that? Take a guess. Climate change. Now, it certainly couldn't answer for all of that. But I believe that is what they would try to convince the nations of. For the last several years, we've been hearing more and more about the reduced ozone layer of the earth, global warming, saving the rainforests, the melting Arctic caps, climate change, and man is passionate about these things, even endangered species like the spotted owl or whales and the California condors. We're told that we're killing the planet, and that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't do more or we could do more, but we're more concerned about saving spotted owls than we are human babies. The governments of the world are becoming more and more extreme about, the, about everything green while the morality of our planet is plummeting into utter depravity. So I think the, the timing of the book of Revelation right now as we study it is very significant. God is going to destroy this earth. And the devastation that we are going to see through the book of Revelation makes that very clear. Chapter 7 has been a brief reprieve from these divine judgments. But the angels that have been holding back the winds for that reprieve are about to break out in horrible fury. And also, although the seal judgments were like nothing the world had ever seen, the judgments to come will be greater than even these seal judgments have been. So, let's look at chapter 8, and I'm going to read the entire chapter. And it says, when he opened the seventh seal, remember the he is the lamb, Jesus Christ. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. 
and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Let's pray. Father, again, we would seek your face as we study this passage of your divine inspired word. Lord, we pray that these things would sober us as it did those who were standing around the throne in heaven. And Lord, I pray that you will give us a divine perspective that these things that we know are going to happen would inspire us and would motivate us by the love of Christ to persuade men. We look to you now for this time and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the first verse or the first trumpet, actually it's the uh, right before the first trumpet at the opening of chapter 8. The Lord opens the seventh seal and the first thing that is said is that there is silence in heaven for half an hour. One thing that's kind of unusual about that is the fact that heaven is running by a clock. We don't, we don't normally think of uh, that time in heaven. I think, though, that the scriptures are trying to relate to us on this. And so John is relating to us what is related to him, that that silence lasted for about half an hour. And I want us to notice the emotional response to the contents of the seventh seal. The four living creatures. Now think about this for a minute. Think of who are the, who are the creatures, who are the, uh, those that are standing in the throne room of God at this point in time. First of all, we have the four living creatures. These four living creatures, their mouths are are stopped for 30 minutes. 
there's silence. Secondly, we're told about the 24 elders sitting on the throne. There's nothing from them. They are silent. Thirdly, we have the countless numbers of angels that are standing around the throne, thousands upon thousands. In fact, chapter 5 tells us 10,000 times 10,000. That's 200 million. Plus, we have the redeemed that were raptured before the tribulation. Plus, we have the countless number, however many it is, that, have, that died during the tribulation. Their spirits are in heaven. All of these are surrounding the throne and their silence. Why? They are stunned at the horror of what is going to follow. I want you to think for a moment about when you first saw the Twin Towers on September 11th. How many of you were able to watch it while it happened? Okay, quite a few of you. Some of you were not alive yet. <laughs> but think of where you were when you saw the first Twin Tower come crashing down. Each floor successively all the way to the bottom. It happened in a matter of seconds. As I recall in our home, as we were watching that, I don't remember a lot of words being spoken because we were all just dumbfounded, taking in the horror of what had just happened. Two thousand nine hundred and seventy seven people died. It was hard to say anything because the reality was so shocking and unconscionable. You knew based on what the news was telling you that there had to be thousands of people trapped in that building when it started to collapse. Now think for a moment, we didn't know and the people in that World Trade Center did not know that that was going to happen. However, the people in heaven standing around the throne know what's going to happen. We didn't even know as the smoke was burning and coming out of the Twin Towers, we didn't know if it was going to collapse or not. But the people, the angels, the four living creatures, the elders, knew something of what was going to happen. Let's add one more layer to the response. Suppose on 9-11, you were the spouse or the mom or dad or the sister or brother of somebody in the Twin Tower. Your horror would have only been magnified because all the time you would be wondering, well, did they get out in time or were they killed in there? Suppose you were the spouse of one of the 343 firefighters who died. Or one of the 37 police officers or one of the eight EMTs. no matter whether their family was in New York City or their extended family was somewhere around the United States, it really doesn't matter because we're all watching it in real time. What was happening in the minds of thousands of mom and dads that knew their son or daughter was there in the building? Now let's go to heaven once again. The multiple, innumerable, Martyrs 
who had died during the tribulation period are standing before the throne. Maybe they're thinking, what about my family that's on earth right now that I witnessed to? It might have even been that some of those family members were the ones who gave their name to others and were responsible for having them martyred. Matthew 10, 21 says, Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. They're in heaven now, but they have family, loved ones on earth. You know that the family, those family members are deceived. You know that they, they believed a lie. They don't understand. You've prayed for them. You witnessed to them while you were on earth. But there would be no more opportunity for you to talk to them. Your only hope is that somebody else on earth might talk to them. Now, whether the people standing around the throne had relatives or friends or loved ones on earth, I think all people, all righteous people would be silent simply at the consideration of what is going to happen to the earth. But I want us to take it even a step further. We've talked about the four living creatures, they're silent. We've talked about the 24 elders and their silence. We've talked about the angelic beings and their silence. We've talked about the redeemed and their silence. But I want you to notice one other thing. There's somebody we haven't even talked about. And that is God himself. God is silent. And what is so significant about that is that God is not delighting in the death of the wicked. The martyrs who died at the hands of people that are on the earth, they're not dancing at what is to come. There's silence on their part as well. A whole world of sinners for whom God gave his son will die because they wouldn't repent. They believed the devil rather than Jesus Christ, rather than God, rather than the scriptures. There is silence. You know, in the Bible, when the Bible says that the Lord will laugh at his enemies, it's not describing some sick delight in the torture of other people. What it's talking about is that humor that sometimes is felt like God must feel when he sees the nation's rage against him as God and think these foolish people think that somehow they can lift their fist against God. They can reject him. They are more powerful than him. That in their foolishness that they can think in the, in the light of the proof that they have of God's existence, they can say there is no God. Psalm 2 is not describing someone like Hitler who conceived some of the most hideous tortures on earth and carried them out on a human race. Not even a, a righteous judge enjoys sentencing a guilty man to death. And I believe this silence is significant because they understand 
more than anyone else what is going to happen. Notice the next thing is that the seven angels were, who stand before God, to them were given seven trumpets. They stood before God in his presence. They were probably angels of a certain rank and privilege. You notice the definite article, and I saw these seven angels. It seems to indicate that these were angels particularly chosen for this job and they stand before God and they were given these seven trumpets and the the trumpet throughout scripture is associated with judgment and they were called forth to announce the seven trumpet judgments the angel that was given a golden censer this was different than the seven angels and he stood at the altar. This, uh, it's not clear whether there's one or two altars in heaven. On earth, in the earthly temple or tabernacle, there were two altars. There was the brazen altar and there was the altar of incense. And the fire normally was taken from the brazen altar to the incense altar. And here it says... Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints ascending before God from the angel's hand, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And the picture is that this fire with the incense smoking on it was wafting up with the prayers of the saints. And it's indicating that these prayers of the saints were acceptable to God. And they were asking, they were asking for how long, Lord, until our blood is been Venge, avenged. I want us to notice, though, that the martyrs in heaven were probably not delivered in answer to their prayers for deliverance. However, they are at rest and they followed Christ even to the death. They did, they followed him all the way. Sometimes we wonder why, but then we look at Jesus and remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He asked the Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, your will be done. So these saints were following in his steps. They, might, they prayed. I'm sure they must have prayed, Lord, deliver us from this. But the Lord, it was not his will. But their prayers have not lost their effectualness. And their prayers are now divine motivation for these seven trumpet judgments to come and the bowl judgments after that. The fire is thrown from the censer to the earth, which is the indication that the judgments are to begin. And that's what we see in verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. That actually began, in part at least, some judgment upon the earth. This earthquake, earthquake and these other things undoubtedly affected it. An earthquake of this magnitude would have probably begun um, volcanoes affecting the whole world and spawning dust and ash again. Lava flows would burn up vegetation and buildings. The explosions into the upper atmosphere may have caused some of the trumpet judgments. 
So let's take the first trumpet judgment. It says in verse 7, The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. I'm going to divide each of these into the divine action and then the devastating result. The divine action here is hail and fire, which is frequently associated with divine judgment in Scripture. In the Egyptian plagues that were brought on while Israel was still in Egypt, the seventh plague of hail and darting fire, the Scripture says, brought devastating destruction to Egypt. In Genesis 19.24, we have the incident where fire rained down out of the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. And these seem to be indications of what is going on here. The specific environmental cause, we are not told but from a scientific standpoint, an earthquake of the magnitude and extent of the one in chapter 8, verse 5, would, could very possibly trigger worldwide volcanic eruptions that would cause uh, atmospheric responses. But it says it was mingled with blood. Now, if God can create a human being, God can create blood that would be mingled with hail and fire and it will be cast to the earth. Notice it doesn't say like blood. There are instances where the descriptions of certain things are said to be like something, but it doesn't say that here. It says mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. What were the de devastating results? Well, a third of the trees were burned up. A third of the earth's trees are burned up. Last year, there was a new, uh, a new survey of, that the DNR did estimating the damage of the derecho, and they said more than 7 million trees across the state of Iowa were destroyed. According to that survey, 32,773 acres of urban tree canopy were wiped out by the storm. But then it went on to say, however, Cedar Rapids lost 65% of its tree canopy. Now, how much is that percentage-wise? That's two-thirds. So depending on the size of the hail, the, ex the severity of the fire that comes with that, the blood mingled with it, those, that, that uh, hail could do significant damage. Later in the book of, of Revelation, we have hail of 100 pounds. That could do significant damage. This would destroy a third of all trees, fruit trees. Um, think about that. Orange trees, apple trees, peach trees, plums, nectarines, bananas, avocados, cherries. When you think that a third of all of the trees in the world would be destroyed, every nation would be affected by that. The economy would be affected by that drastically. I'm sure that would also hurt crops, just uh, corn crops and, and so forth. It also says that the green grass was burned up. Which is interesting because in Revelation 9.4, during the fifth trumpet, God commands the demonic locust not to harm the grass, which would seem to indicate there was still grass in existence. Now let me offer two explanations for that. First, there would have been a somewhat of a time lapse between this trumpet and the fifth trumpet allowing grass to grow. And then, secondly, in most parts of the earth, grass is not green the year round, but it's seasonal. So 
burning of all the grass that is green during a particular season would leave the remainder untouched until its season of dormancy is over. And so the text simply says all green grass was burned up. And to sum that up, a third of the world's vegetation is destroyed by hail, fire, and blood. Now, what, what happened when there were a shortage, shortage, at least when some people thought there might be a shortage of things? What happened? Yeah, hoarding. But this would be a true shortage. There will be hoarding. There would probably be violence. The fire falling from the sky would cause fires to rage all over the world, similar to the fires that we saw in California over the last year. Houses and businesses would be destroyed. That's just the first trumpet. Let's look at the second trumpet now. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. So in the first one, vegetation was destroyed. In the second trumpet, the seas are struck. And it says it's something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Now, I'm not, I, I don't know what that is. Some have said it's a, again, it's a massive meteor burning brightly as it comes down through the earth's atmosphere and it hits the sea and that, that's probably the most plausible natural phenomenon if it were of the magnitude that this is talking about, like a mountain, and it hit the sea at that magnitude, it would probably have a stronger effect than even an atomic bomb. It says, a third of the sea becomes blood. What are the devastating results? Well, if, the, if a third of the sea becomes blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea would die. It says also a third of the ships were destroyed. A massive meteorite of that impact would hitting the sea would undoubtedly kill and, and just the results of that damage as it hits the sea floor could also trigger another earthquake all by itself, moving tectonic plates right there in that specific region. I want to just show you some pictures of ships that were destroyed by the tsunami of 2004. Go ahead. You may have already seen these. This does not show some real large ships, voyagers. But I will say this, that the tsunamis that this will start will be much bigger than the 2004 tsunami. And that tsunami took place very close to the land. And when it happened, an immediate tidal wave was headed right towards the land, but the other tidal wave headed over towards India and on over to Africa. And there was damage in all of those places as a result. Over 200,000 people died, almost 230,000. This would be much worse. Imagine a wall of water 100 feet high going 500 miles an hour. That is what the oceanic, whatever the name of the organization is, said was the speed, is the speed of a tsunami or could be.
if, if something the size of a mountain landed in the ocean, it would be like throwing a pebble in the water and the resulting ring would just go out in all directions. Nothing, it wouldn't just be two directions, it would be all directions. Some would go all the way to Antarctica. Some would go out to, up to Iceland. Others would go towards Central America, North America, and South America, if this were the Atlantic Ocean. Some would go to Europe and Africa. In all of those directions, there would be damage with the size of that tsunami. But hitting in the middle of the ocean, it would undoubtedly kill and destroy a lot of uh, sea life. And there would be large portions in the sea, wounded fish, wounded things that would leak blood. Human bodies from the coast would be washed out to sea, becoming food for predatory fish and scavengers, causing bloody waters. But even in, in, in all of this, I still favor God just turning the water to blood for a third of the ocean. I believe it will be a, a miracle and again, just pointing to the fact that this is divine in origin. No one can deny it. Let's go to the third trumpet now. The third trumpet. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was bitter. We'll look at the divine action first. A great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. The word star here... The Greek word is aster, which could refer to any heavenly body other than the sun and moon. This may have been a comet or an asteroid of some kind, or maybe a specific miraculous star like the star of Beth Bethlehem was, whom God appointed, created specifically for this event. It burned like a torch as it fell to the earth, going through the earth's atmosphere, and that would support the meaning of the word torch. The, the Greek word is lampos, and it was used in ancient times to describe meteors and comets. And then the debris from that star fell on a third of the fresh water rivers and springs of water, making them impossible to drink. The wormwood plant is a real plant. We find it the word is used eight times in the Old Testament, one time in the New Testament, and that's this time. It was toxic and poisonous. Wormwood, it was speaking of a shrub whose leaves are used in the manufacture of a liquor so toxic that its, manufacturers, its manufacture is banned in many countries. It can be especially harmful to the nervous system. Some, um, back in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, one particular writer on the book of Revelation felt that this star was probably a nuclear weapon of some sort that exploded. And some of what gave, um, maybe gave to some a little bit of notoriety for that is the fact that the word Chernobyl is actually the Russian word for wormwood. And some uh, believe that it will be a nuclear explosion of some sort similar to that. In fact, if you were to look up the word wormwood in the Russian Bible or the Ukrainian Bible, it would use the word Chernobyl 
for the word worm, wormwood. What were the devastating results? Well, it says because of its deadly effects, the star will be called wormwood. And it means that the water becomes bitter and poisonous to drink. This will cause water shortages all over the world. It will cause many men to die from the water. The rivers will run with deadly poison. The wells will become springs of death. The lakes and reservoirs will be filled with toxic waters. People may be able to be, survive for a little while on, on their food rations, but everybody needs water. And because of a lack of water, there will be many people that will die. The fresh water supply will cause widespread death. But I want to also offer another added meaning, not, not something, not an alternative, but just an added layer to this whole issue going on. Wormwood was symbolic of bitterness of heart caused by difficult circumstances. And although the primary interpretation of this is literally referring to bitter water that was poisonous, for many unbelievers, the, the terrible events of the four trumpets will make them bitter of heart towards God rather than repentant. Rather than seeing their sinfulness and the justice of God in all this, they will strike out at God. They will be bitter towards God. I want you to just turn over to uh, Revelation 9 and look at verse 20. This is at the end of the sixth trumpet. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And then I'd like you to turn to chapter 16. Starting in verse 9, and this is one of the bold judgments. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. See, at any stage in this, all of these people had the same opportunities that the people that are now in heaven who who had died during the first part of the millennium or first part of the tribulation, all of these people have the same opportunity to repent. But rather than acknowledging their own sinfulness and God's justice in what he is doing, they hardened their hearts like Pharaoh of Egypt. Think about that. Pharaoh saw those ten plagues. He even had the testimony of his counselor saying, Pharaoh, this is not, we can't duplicate this. This is the hand of God. But in essence, what he did is shake his fist in the face of God. At any point, if he would have relented, God would have stopped the plagues. I want us to note that the opportunity to repent is not closed until death. I think of the thief on the cross. There were two thieves on the cross. Both, it says, started out cursing God. But I believe the one that repented as he observed Jesus Christ on his cross realized this man is not like any other man. 
And he even ended up rebuking the other thief for his cursing of Jesus Christ. And this one thief confessed his guilt saying, I, the two, you and I, we're, we deserve to be here, but this man has done nothing wrong. He doesn't deserve to be here. The same is true today. Unless a person has so hardened his heart, there's always time to repent. But once a person dies, no one can pray a person out of hell. There's no such doctrine in the Bible as far as purgatory. How can we explain why one thief repented and the other didn't? One hardened his bitter heart. He wouldn't acknowledge his sin and the other softened it. And I just would remind us that we can harden our heart and we need, we need to be careful. And if there's someone here today that needs to be saved, you need to soften your heart. Let's look at the fourth trumpet now. The fourth trumpet, then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. As this fourth trumpet sounds, the focus of divine judgment now is not on earth, but it's rather in the heavens. And I'm talking about the sky and not, not the heavens where God is enthroned. After the devastation of the first three trumpet judgments, I would imagine that world leaders will, along with leading scientists and climatologists in the United Nations, will be seeking to answer what has happened through natural means and the terrible effects of the Earth's ecosystem. But now we have something happening that is cosmic. It's coming from the sky. And it says, a third of the sun, moon, and stars were struck so that they were darkened and did not shine for a third of the day and a third of the night. It's like an eclipse. However they're darkened, they're darkened. It doesn't tell us how. But they were obscured from sight. That's what the word darkened literally means. They were obscured from sight. Obviously, a divine act that will take place in the daytime when it would normally be light out. And the results were a third of the day did not shine and likewise a third of the night. How do we answer that? I don't know. But this will affect the whole ecological, ecological system of the world. It would be reminiscent of the ninth Egyptian plague. But this is temporary as God will later in, increase the amount of heat coming from the sun in chapter 16. But at this point, there's a loss of heat from the sun because the sun will be uh, shaded and it will cause temperatures to plunge all over the world, disrupting the earth's weather system, weather patterns, the sea tides leading to violent, unpredictable storms and tides, the destruction of crops, and further loss of animal and human lives. Again, it will seem to those that are inhabiting the earth that the universe is just unraveling. The Old Testament prophets associated this, this, these signs with the day of the Lord. I'd like you to turn to the book of Joel. And it's right after Daniel and Hosea and then Joel.
We see it implied in verse 10 of chapter 1 or chapter 2. It says, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. And then look at chapter um, 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus even added his own prediction in Luke 21, 25 and 26. We see similar wording going on there. I'm not going to take the time. But as the fourth seal closes, we then hear another voice. John looked and an angel was flying through the air giving an ominous warning regarding the last three trumpet blasts. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. I want you to notice there's no silence here. There's no reprieve here. He's already announcing the next three blasts of the trumpet and how horrific they would be. A woe for each of those three blasts that are coming. A woe for each person of the Godhead. A woe indicating the piling severity of each of those three blasts. The descriptive phrase to the inhabitants of the earth is really used as a term describing those who reject the gospel. I'd like you to look at several things here. Look at chapter 6, verse 10. It says, speaking of the martyrs, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Now go to chapter 11, verse 10. Here in this, there are two witnesses that are put to death. And it says in verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, the two witnesses' death making merry, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now go to chapter 13, verse 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then... Verse 12, and he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell in the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. And then go to Revelation 17. Verse 2, I'll start at about halfway through verse 1. Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And then verse 8, the beast that you saw was was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. As we 
think about that as we're going through these seven trumpet judgments we are now in the second half of the tribulation and it does seem that there are fewer and fewer people saved through the tri tribulation what do we say to all this well, again, I would, I would try to emphasize that we need to listen to the writer of Hebrews who said this, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Those who went to work on September 11th, 2001, expected to come home that day. They had no reason to think otherwise. They had none, no knowledge that there was a scheme a plot that had been planned for months and years. But they didn't come home that day. Their lives, their souls were not annihilated. They would live for all eternity. There's only two places to go, heaven or hell. That is something that they did not know about. And our two responses here this morning are either one of salvation. If, if we know about it, then we have an obligation. In fact, Paul put it this way, a debt. We are debtors to others. If we aren't, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, now you know about this. Have a tender heart. Respond appropriately in repentance to God who gave us this in advance because he does not want us to experience the tribulation period. He wants us to be saved. For believers, the Christian has an unshakable foundation in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. We know. But we had better live our lives in accordance with that knowledge. And be telling those about what is to come. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for for your love that has been shown to the entire world by giving your son. Help us, Lord, in our conversation with, with others to challenge the philosophies of this world today and the false religions because, Lord, eternity hangs on those truths. We cannot force people to be saved, but we can love them enough to tell them. And I pray that you would give us persuasiveness and boldness and grace and love through your Holy Spirit's influence in us. Lord, I pray that you would open many hearts to the gospel. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning, may you, may you work mightily in their heart. May they, may they voluntarily open their heart 
to the love of Christ. Thank you for your mercy and grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like us to turn in our hymnal, hymnals to number 331. This is a, a wonderful invitation. Have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin as he knocks and asks admission, sinner, will you let him in? Notice verse 4. Room and time now give to Jesus. Soon will pass God's day of grace. Soon your heart left cold and silent and your Savior's pleading cease. Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now his word obey. Swing your heart's door widely open. Bid him enter while you may. Let's all stand together as we sing. <clears throat> Have you any room for Jesus, he who bore your load of sin? As he knocks and asks admission, sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory, hasten now his word obey swing your heart's door widely open bid him enter while you may let's sing the second as the last room for pleasure room for business but for Christ the crucified, not a place that he can enter in the heart for which he died. Room for Jesus, King of glory, hasten now his word, obey. Sweet door widely open bid him enter while you may Father may hearts be open this morning I pray Lord that our hearts even as believers would be tender and open to your spirit's wooing and I pray for those who may not know Christ Lord Give them op another opportunity. I pray, Father, that they will see the seriousness of their condition and they will see how much you have done to help them in their need. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.